Good morning, everyone. So great to see you all out there this morning. First service is, is starting to starting to thicken up a little bit. I like it. I like it. So good to see your uh, your faces this morning, and uh, just welcome to the Community Chapel of Heston. Um, I have a few announcements to uh, get us rolling this morning, and uh, so just some reminders. Of course, we have youth. Uh, going on in the gym this evening at 6.30, and we were working through a Christmas series, and that's been a lot of fun, um, doing some some fun games and some some great teaching with uh, Pastor Doug. 
And then, of course, we do have the Sunday evening service happening at the same time here um, in the sanctuary, and that is the the video series called The Case for Christmas. So again, um, great stuff to just kind of build up... Um, build your confidence um, in the faith that you already have and, and be able to um, defend your faith um, too to others. Uh, sometimes we feel um, a little um, inadequate at doing that and um, these series really are strengthening for doing things like that, building you up and giving you that confidence to, to uh, um, talk to others about the faith that you have. Um, Big reminder today is that the sock tree gifts are due today. So um, just we ask that you put those back by the, the tree out in the um, meeting area out there. And uh, if you have forgotten it, um, just get it back to the uh, church as soon as possible, whether it be this evening or um, early uh, this week to the church office. We want to get those um, to uh, backyard ministries so that they can distribute them. Um, also, a change has been made in the live nativity this year. So not only have we moved it from the property to here, so it will be right here um, at the church, um, just with all the um, potential um, issues with um, COVID and things like that, uh, we're just going to do a uh, drive-by live nativity this year with setting up the nativity under the uh, drive through area out there and then just having cars drive by. We'll still be having um, singing and scripture, um, but it will be more of a still uh, picture other than moving through it like we've done in past um, past years. And that will just be Friday night. Um, and um, the times should have been on this screen, and I can't remember them right now. Uh, child dedication service is December 13th in the second service. So if you have a kiddo that you would like to be uh, dedicated, um, just get in touch with either one of us, um, pastors or the church office, so we can get you on the schedule for the 13th. Chiz Ryder concert. Um, uh, if you've never had a chance to see Chiz, um, very, very um, enthusiastic uh, um, trumpet player. And uh, man, he does some fantastic things on that. Makes some beautiful music. So that's December 19th, if you want to check that out here um, in this uh, sanctuary as well. Again, working on that Christmas Eve offering. So just uh, be thinking about that. We are trying to uh, um, hopefully bless seven of our ministries. with a. Um, we have a goal of reaching $7,000 uh, with that. So if you can think of ways you can give there, that would be awesome. Um, again, just a heads up, new members classes starting at the beginning of the year. Uh, so if that is something you're interested in, and again, get in touch with one of the elders, one of the uh, pastors, or the church office so we can get you set up with that. I think that is all the announcements I have this morning. Uh, so if we could bow our heads and go to prayer, that would be awesome. Dear Heavenly Father, uh, we thank you so much for this opportunity to be in your house of worship this morning. And God, our goal is to just to, to, to uh, worship you this morning, God, and to bring uh, you the glory that you deserve. And, and uh, we just want to thank you so much for uh, that opportunity. We want to thank you for the blessings that you do uh, provide us um, in our lives. We, we thank you um, that we have this church building to come to. Um, there are many um, in the world that do not have this opportunity and can't meet with the freedom that we do. Um, and so, um, number one, we thank you for that. But number two, we pray for those who have to meet in, in, in silence and in, in, uh, secrecy and uh, uh, be with them as they build their faith. Um, God, we want to uh, thank you uh, for the gifts that you bestow upon us, and, and we um, thank you so much that we can give back to you a portion of that, and we just ask that um, the offerings that we bring to you can be used to further your kingdom. And dear Heavenly Father, um, most of all, we are thankful for our salvation. Um, it is certainly something that we do not um, deserve, um, but it is a gift that you've given uh, freely, and uh, we are forever and eternally thankful uh, for that uh, for that gift, uh, that that gift that started in um, a manger um, so many years ago, and, and just that that baby boy 
that cry that um, broke the 400-year silence. And uh, we are so, so thankful for that. And then for that baby boy to um, grow into a man, um, a perfect man, and die on a cross, a death that he did not deserve um, for our sins. Nothing that he had done, everything that we had done. And uh, then rise again, um, again, giving us the hope um, in eternal life, that we will rise with him as well. God, we ask for forgiveness for those sins that get in our way and, and trip us up, and we just ask for forgiveness for those and, and, and uh, to be able to uh, repent of those and, and just go a different direction. God, we just ask a blessing over all aspects of the service today, whether it be um, from the um, prayers that are preached, the sermons that are preached, the um, music that is sung. Uh, we just want to bring you uh, glory, God, and uh, we just ask a, a blessing on it, that the words that come from this stage are words that you want us to hear this morning, words that will penetrate our heart and draw us closer to you. And we do ask a special blessing over uh, Pastor Doug's message this morning, that again, um, it would be words that pierce our heart, convict our hearts, um, and ultimately um, uh, change our hearts in drawing us closer to you and being better servants for you and being uh, willing to uh, be your hands and feet on this earth and reaching out to those around us. Uh, God, we love and praise you. Amen. Thank you, Jamie. Good morning, church family. It's a joy to be here, to be able to continue worshiping with you all. I have this call to continue worshiping from Psalm 119. How happy are those whose way is blameless, who walk according to the Lord's instruction. How happy are those who keep his decrees and seek him with all their heart. They do nothing wrong, they walk in his ways. You have commanded that your precepts be diligently kept. If only my ways were committed to keeping your statutes, then I would not be ashamed. When I think about all your commands, I will praise you with an upright heart when I learn your righteous judgments. I will keep your statutes. Never abandon me. Um, pray these words to this song, How Firm a Foundation, with us in response to that revelation in Scripture about the Word of God. firm a foundation, ye saints of the Lord, it is laid for your faith in his excellent word. What more can he say than to you he hath said, to you who for refuge to Jesus have fled? Fear not, I am with thee, O oh, be not dismayed, for I am thy God, I will still give thee aid. I'll strengthen thee, help thee, and cause thee to stand upheld by my gracious omnipotent hand. When through the deep waters I call thee to go, the rivers of woe shall not thee overflow. For I will be with thee thy troubles to bless and sanctify to thee thy deepest distress. When through fiery trials as thy pathway shall lie, my grace all sufficient shall be thy supply. The flame shall not hurt thee, I only desire thy dross to consume and thy gold to refine. The soul that on 
and Jesus has learned for repose. I will run, not, I will, I will not desert to his foes. That soul, though all hell, should endeavor to shake. I'll never, no, never, no, never forsake. I'm singing about the firmness of um, the foundation of the word reminds us of our, um, of us not being firm, of our shakiness, of our unwavering hope. Um, so confess with us um, as we sing this song that we, um, that we sang for the first time last week. Um, pray these words with us. We are not what we should be. We haven't sought what we should see. We've seen your glory, Lord, but looked away. Our hearts are bent, our eyes are dim. Our finest works are stained with sin. And emptiness has shadowed all our ways. Jesus into our night, drive our dark away, till your glory fills our eyes. Jesus Christ, shine into our night, bind us to your cross, where we find light. Chase the world, forget your grace, but you have never failed to bring us back. Reveal the depths of what you've done, the death you died, the victory won. You made a way for us to know your love. Jesus Christ, shine into our night, drive our dark away, till your glory fills our eyes. Jesus Christ, shine into our night, bind us to your cross. Where we find life. We are not what we should be. We haven't sought what we should seek. We've seen your glory, Lord, but looked away. Let's continue worshiping through the lighting of the Advent candle. Last Sunday, we lit the first candle in our Advent wreath, the candle of hope. We light it again as we remember that Christ will come again to fulfill of all of God's promises to us.
The second candle of Advent is the candle of peace. Peace is a gift that we must be prepared for. God gives us the gift of peace when we turn to him in faith. The prophet Isaiah calls Christ the Prince of Peace. Through the other prophets, God asks us to prepare our heart so that he may come in. Our hope is in God and in his Son, Jesus Christ. Our peace is found in him. We light this candle today to remind us that he brings peace to all who trust in him. Let us pray. Loving God, thank you for the peace you give us through Jesus. Help us prepare our hearts to receive him. Bless our worship. Guide us in all that we say and do. We ask it in the name of the one born in Bethlehem. Amen. Peace came to earth, peace on earth, and mercy mild. God and sinners reconciled. Pray these words once more with us as we sing, Hark the Herald Angels Sing.
Amen. Thank you, um, Jamie and Isaac and Nicole and, and Robin for um, serving us this morning uh, through music. And, and again, good morning to all of you who are joining us either here in person or at home online. We are very excited to have you here with us today. As you can see, you probably see, saw as you came in this morning and you can see on stage here, we are officially in the Christmas season here at the Community Chapel of Heston. And, you know, it's taken a lot to get to this point this year. How many of you, show of hands, are ready for 2020 to be over? That's what I thought. But you know what? We're not there yet. We still have another month to go. And, uh, you know, this has probably been, most of us could probably say this has been the craziest year that we have been through. But again, we got one month to go, the month of December here. And, um, you know, in the midst of everything that's been going on this year, and in the midst of everything that we're currently still going through, it can be very difficult to enjoy the holidays like we normally do. I was just talking to someone this past week, you know, asking them how their Thanksgiving was. And they're like, you know, it was okay, but it just wasn't like normal because they weren't able to have all the family members get together like normal and have big gatherings and things like that. So like, it was okay, but it just wasn't the same. And they were talking about how they missed that. And, and, and maybe the same was for you and, and your families as well at Thanksgiving. But um, now we've come to Christmas. And Christmas, as the song goes, is the most wonderful time of the year. But can we really say that this year? Can we really say that during 2020, that Christmas is the most wonderful time of the year? Can we really enjoy and celebrate during this interesting time that we're living in? And uh, we're starting a new series this morning uh, that we'll be going through here in the month of December um, called, well, asking a question, is it Christmas? Is it the most wonderful time of the year? And what we're going to do over the next couple of weeks is we're really going to look at Christmas and what Christmas really is all about. And our hope in going through this series is for all of us to see, you know, even in a year like this, or even in a struggle or whatever circumstances you may be going through, maybe not this year or next year or whatever year, that even in the midst of all of that, we can still find reason to celebrate this Christmas. And so, if you bow with me, we're going to open with a word of prayer, and then we will dig into the message this morning. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for uh, this day that you've given to us, uh, another opportunity that we have to, uh, to gather as brothers and sisters in Christ and, and worship you together. Lord, I pray that we would all realize that, you know, when it comes to, to worship, you know, we don't just worship on uh, Sunday mornings or just when we're here in uh, this facility, that really worship should be uh, part of our lives, that everywhere that we go or who we're with, that really our lives should be uh, worship to you and, and praising you and thanking you for who you are and what you've done for us. And, uh, and Lord, as we just went through Thanksgiving, thinking of so many things that, that even during a year like this that we still have to be thankful for. And now as we're getting into the Christmas season, we start to look at what Christmas really is all about. Uh, Lord, we're just so thankful for who you are. And that even though we are your enemies, wanting nothing to do with you, and have sinned against you, you still loved us each and every one of us, and you sent your Son to this earth ultimately uh, to die for us and to be that perfect sacrifice so that we can be free of our sins and be reconciled back to you, have that relationship with you. And Lord, I pray we would never take that for granted, that our lives should be worship and service to you for as long as you have us here on this earth. 
Lord, as we, we, we dig into that a little bit this morning, I ask that you would be with the message, and uh, I pray that you'd give me the right words to, to share this morning. I pray it would be something that, as we're looking at this, we can take a good look at our lives, and um, as was prayed earlier in the service, that we wouldn't just be hearers of the Word, that we would be doers. We would take the things that we see in your Word and apply it to our lives, line it up with how we're living. If we need to make a, a change, that we would, because your Word doesn't change. But we should change our lives so that we can serve you to the best of our ability here on this earth and be that light for you in this dark world. And so I thank you for those who are here this morning. We think of those who, um, who couldn't make it, maybe if they're not feeling the greatest, maybe if they're um, traveling, maybe if they're um, recovering from surgeries. Um, Lord, we just ask that you would be with those who couldn't join us today and um, you would just bless them and, and be with them and bring them back to us safely when possible. Um, Lord, as we um, have been talking about, we're going to talk a little bit today about um, trials and, and difficulties in our life. You know, there's so many things going on right now, and um, Lord, I don't even know um, what all's happening with everyone who's here this morning. Uh, but Lord, I pray as we go through these difficult times that we keep our eyes focused on you. That even in the midst of those hard times, those difficult situations, that we can realize that we still have hope and can experience true joy because of who you are and what you've done for us. And I pray that that's what we would see through the message today. And I pray that you would just uh, bless the remainder of this service and I ask that everything that is said and done would be for your honor and your glory. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. If you have your Bibles with you, and I hope that you do, I invite you to turn with me to the book of Matthew. Matthew chapter 2 this morning. To be honest with you, I don't know exactly um, what passages of Scripture or where exactly Pastor Scott is going to be going in the next couple weeks throughout this series. I don't know if we're going to dig into the, uh, the, the Christmas account or, or not. Uh, but what we're going to do this morning, it's going to be a little bit different. We're actually starting at the end of the Christmas story that we are so familiar with here in Matthew chapter 2. We're actually picking up right after the wise men come to visit Jesus, which we know that actually took place a little bit after the whole nativity scene. Uh, this was probably a year or two afterwards when the wise men came, even though when we see the nativity scenes at Christmas, you know, usually you see the wise men there at the stable. Probably on Friday when you come to our drive through nativity, you'll probably see the wise men there. But we know that's not exactly how it took place. It was a good year or two afterwards. If you didn't know that, I just ruined the whole nativity scene for you. But that's okay. Um, but that's where we're picking up this morning, towards the end of that. So we're going to be looking here in Matthew chapter 2. Starting in verse 13, and I want to make sure that you guys are awake, so if you could all stand, we're going to stand and read this together here, Matthew chapter 2, I invite you to follow along with me, starting in verse 13, and we're going to read through to the end of the chapter. So Matthew chapter 2, starting in verse 13, says, Now when they had gone, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream and said, Get up. Take the child and his mother and flee to Egypt and remain there until I tell you. For Herod is going to search for the child to destroy him. So Joseph got up and took the child and his mother while it was still night and left for Egypt. He remained there until the death of Herod. This was to fulfill what had been spoken by the Lord through the prophet. Out of Egypt I called my son. Verse 16, then when, then when Herod saw that he had been tricked by the Magi, he became very enraged and sent and slew all the male children who were in Bethlehem and all its vicinity from two years old and under, according to the time which he had determined from the Magi. Then what had been spoken through Jeremiah the prophet was fulfilled. A voice was heard in Ramah, weeping and great mourning. Rachel weeping for her children, and she refused to be comforted, because they were no more. But when Herod died, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt and said, Get up, 
Take the child and his mother and go into the land of Israel, for those who sought the child's life are dead. So Joseph got up, took the child and his mother, and came into the land of Israel. But when he heard that Archelaus was reigning over Judea in place of his father Herod, he was afraid to go there. Then after being warned by God in a dream, he left for the regions of Galilee and came and lived in a city called Nazareth. This was to fulfill what was spoken through the prophets, he shall be called a Nazarene. Amen. You may be seated. All right, so just to kind of, again, go over what we just read together. So when the wise men came, well, the wise men came to see Jesus, and then they left. They were warned in a dream not to return back to King Herod, and so they decided to go a different direction. At the same time, Joseph had a dream where God told him to take his family to Egypt because, again, because King Herod wanted to kill Jesus. He was afraid of this new king of the Jews that had now been born, and so he, wanted to, he was afraid this king was going to come in and take away his throne, invade his kingdom, and so um, he has all the babies in Bethlehem killed. And so because of that, God warns Joseph in his dream to take his family to Egypt. So in the middle of the night, Joseph takes Mary and their child and travel 75 to 100 miles from Bethlehem to Egypt. Meanwhile, King Herod is infuriated because the wise men didn't obey him and didn't come back and tell him where baby Jesus was. So again, he makes this decree to have all the male children, two years old and younger, in Bethlehem, killed. So you can imagine what's going on there in Bethlehem. I mean, all these families who just lost their baby child. I mean, a lot of pain, a lot of weeping, sorrow going on in the town of Bethlehem. Well, not long after, King Herod dies. And then Joseph has another dream where God told him that it was now time to bring his family back to Israel. But Herod's son, Archelaus, was now reigning in Judea, which again makes it a little unsafe to live there. And as we read, Joseph is afraid of that. And so once again, God tells Joseph through another dream to go to Nazareth. And that is where Joseph, Mary, and Jesus go to live. So, what does all of that have to do with Christmas? What does that little history lesson we just went through have to do with Christmas? What does it have to do with us this morning? Well, real quick, what I want us to see today, I want us to see three reasons to rejoice this Christmas from here in Matthew chapter 2. In this passage that we just read... It doesn't just have to do with people 2,000 years ago. It actually goes back much further in history. Because if you, took, if you noticed as we read through there, three different times, three different times Matthew is quoting or making reference to an Old Testament prophet or an Old Testament passage of Scripture. He says something like, this was done in order to fulfill the prophet, or this prophecy was then fulfilled. And so what we're going to do this morning, we're going to look at those three different things and see why that is so significant. And so, again, what we're going to see, if you're taking notes, we're going to see three reasons to rejoice this Christmas. And so the first point that we're going to see is a new exodus. We're going to see that Jesus brings in a new exodus. And I'll explain what that means here. Um, for us. But the first time that we notice this in our text is if you look with me at verse 15. Because there Matthew says, He remained there until the death of Herod. This was to fulfill what had been spoken by the Lord through the prophet, Out of Egypt I called my son. Now I'm going to warn you, I'm looking for some audience particip participation this morning. So I hope you're awake and I hope you're ready to participate here. Does anyone know what Old Testament prophet Matthew is quoting here? 
If you have a study Bible, it might tell you there. Anyone know? All right, we're all shy or we just don't know. I'm going to tell you. And if you come back second service, you can answer this and be, sound really smart. Okay? This is found, this is from the prophet Hosea. Okay? We read this in Hosea chapter 11, verse 1, which I believe this will be on the screen for you, but Hosea chapter 11, verse 1 says this. When Israel was a youth, I loved him, and out of Egypt I called my son. Now, if you remember, a few weeks ago, I think it was three weeks ago, two or three weeks ago, we talked about the importance of context when reading and studying Scripture. So, what is the context of Hosea chapter 11 here? Well, the prophet Hosea is talking about God's deliverance of His people from slavery in Egypt. And if you can think back in in history, in, in your Old Testament, when God delivered His people from slavery in Egypt, how did He do that? He used, he used Moses, he used Aaron, but he did it by using ten miraculous plagues. Okay, so again, I am looking for some audience participation this morning because what I have with me today, since it's Christmas, I got my bag of gifts here. And what we have here in this bag, I have ten gifts. Ten gifts that are going to help represent each of those ten plagues of Egypt. And I'm going to see if we can remember what they are. And if you want to, I shouldn't say cheat, but if you want to, want to help and you want to turn back to Exodus chapter 7, I believe. Exodus chapter 7 through Exodus chapter 11, you'll see the ten plagues of Egypt. And so we're going to go through those real quick. Just a, a refresher. See if we can remember what those pen plugs were. But does anyone, and again, I want some participation. I know you're wearing a mask, but I can still hear you if you talk loud. Does anyone know what the first plague was? Excuse me? Blood. Okay, very good. I didn't even have to pull out the gift for a hint. So, you remember, God turned the water from the Nile River, which the Nile River in Egypt was a symbol of life, And turned it into a symbol of death. He turned the water into blood. Now you'll be happy to know I do not have blood in here um, this morning. Um, That would be weird. Um, But I do have some fruit punch with me. And what I really wanted to do, I want since they're gifts, I wanted to give them away. But there's a couple reasons I can't do that. Number one, I need them for second service. Um, And number two, some of these things I had to actually borrow from kids. So I can't really give their things away. And also for this, if I would give this to you, you might be tempted to drink it in here, and I could get in big trouble, so we're not going to do that. So, but very good. So he turned, God turned the water from the Nile River into blood. That was the first plague. I need my Bible, or I'm going to get these out of order. Okay, so that was the first plague. Does anyone know what the second plague was? If you need a hint. Very good. This is a frog, if you can't tell. But frogs... Very good. There were frogs everywhere. Frogs coming up out of the water. And what's interesting, if you read here in Exodus, when this happened, Pharaoh was was shocked and surprised that this happened. So he calls his magicians in to see if they can do it as well. And, And they are actually able to call frogs out of the water, which is very interesting because, you know, I was thinking, you know, if I was Pharaoh, it would have been smart for him to have his magicians get rid of the frogs but he just added more frogs to the problem. So there's literally frogs everywhere. Okay? That's the second plague. Third. The third plague. Does anyone know? Gnats. There were gnats. And if you were in Egypt at this time and you had some insect repellent, uh, you'd have a lot of friends. They'd be coming to get this from you. Um, during this time, but there's, there's these gnats all over the people, all over the animals, everywhere. And then to add to the gnats, the next plague, flies. Very good. And so I brought my 
fly swatter with me. This is awesome if you don't have it. It's not a tennis racket. Well, you can, it's kind of like a tennis racket. You can swat flies with it. Um, this probably wouldn't have been very good back then because you need batteries to actually get it to work. Um, but um, flies, again, flies everywhere, going all over the place. And what's interesting, if you read here in Exodus, this is the first plague that we see affect the Egyptians in a way that doesn't affect the Israelites. And so this is just everywhere around the Egyptians, the Egyptian land, flies everywhere. Be it so annoying, right? All right, so then we get to plague number five. Does anyone know? The livestock. So I brought my farmer's hat with me this morning. So the livestock. So all of their, the Egyptians' livestock, the cows, the horses, were, were, had this weird plague disease on them. And so, so they, were, they were all sick. And again, this is just for um, the Egyptians, you know, not, for, not for the Israelites. Okay, very good. Anyone else? What's next? What number are we on? One, two, three, four, five, six. Put some band-aids here. Because the next plague was the boils. All over their skin. Pharaoh, his magicians, all the Egyptian people, their slaves, you know, all over, except for the Israelites. Which again, I don't know if these band-aids would have even helped, but that's what I got with me this morning. And again, if you remember what happened, after each one of these plagues, God had Moses go to Pharaoh and say, Pharaoh, let my people go. And, and these things were so, we can't even imagine what this would have been like. But these plagues were so bad that Pharaoh's like, okay, just, I'll do it. I'll let your people go. Just put an end to this. But then his heart was hardened and he would not let his people go. Okay, next plague. Hail. I don't know if this would actually stop any hail or not. I probably shouldn't have done that. Um, but hail, falling down, and it says here, hail like hail and fire flashing, um, such had not been seen in all the land of Egypt. So, again, I really shouldn't have done that, because now I don't know what to do with it. Um, but hail coming down everywhere. Next was the locust. So I got a little grasshopper cricket here. This is Jiminy. But locust everywhere eating everything that's left that's green. So much that like when you walked out of your house or whatever they had back then, all you saw on the ground were locusts. Covered the entire land. Everywhere. Then we get to the ninth plague. And it was total darkness. Again, this probably wouldn't have helped because you need batteries. This isn't even a good one. But total darkness over land for three days. And it says here, I believe it's over here, darkness that may be felt. Like, did you ever, were you ever in a place that's like pitch black that you can just feel it? Total darkness over the land. It was so dark that the people we read, they were afraid to even get out of their house because they didn't know what was around them. Total darkness over the land which all sets the stage for the tenth and final plague, which is the plague of death. Death for the firstborn. I brought a little lamb with me because God made a way for His people to escape this death plague. And that was for them to grab a unblemished lamb, bring it into their home, and kill it. And take the blood of that lamb and put it over their doorposts. And so at that, when that night came and God's judgment would come over the land, if you came to your house and saw that blood on the doorposts, it was a symbol, 
or it was to say that that payment had already been paid by that lamb. And so, would pass by your house, saving the life of the firstborn. So that Passover is a picture of God's gracious deliverance over His people. And then we see it even more as you read through Exodus. You get through, through Exodus chapter 14 where because at this final plague, that was enough for Pharaoh. He finally lets his people go. Then one more time, his heart is hardened, and so the people come after. They get to the Red Sea, and they cross the Red Sea, and they are finally free from slavery. And so we see God's gracious deliverance of His people. That's the context. That is what Hosea, in Hosea chapter 11, that's what he's referring back to. Okay? So with that background, we come to our text in Matthew chapter 2. And when we read about Jesus going into Egypt and then coming out of Egypt, we see there's actually a bigger picture being painted for us here. There's something more for us to see. This, this little part of the story, it's not just that they're running away and hiding from King Herod. There's something bigger that we need to see this morning. Because, you know, back in the Old Testament, what we just went through, we see the mercy of God. Him saving His people by bringing this miraculous deliverance from slavery and from Pharaoh. And and these are the stories. This is what the people of Israel, they would recount these events over and over again, year after year after year, of how God... Passed, by, passed over them and how God delivered them from slavery. But it was really pointing to something even bigger that was going to happen. Because now, when we get to the New Testament, and Jesus is born, and He's come to this earth, we also see the mercy of God. Him bringing the Messianic Deliverer to this earth from Egypt. And so in his coming, this coming out of Egypt, we see Jesus is bringing in a new exodus for his people. That instead of saving the people from slavery, from Pharaoh, Christ has come to save his people from slavery to sin. In fact, if you just flip over a page to Matthew chapter 1, in Matthew chapter 1, verse 21, it says, She will bear a son. You shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. So just as in the Old Testament there, just as Israel was God's son brought out of Egypt, so now Jesus, as God's son, was also brought out of Egypt, bringing in a new exodus. So that's the first thing. Second reason to rejoice. Our second point this morning, we see a new covenant. First we saw a new exodus, now we see a new covenant. And so this is from the second quotation that we see in our text in verses 17 and 18 of Matthew chapter 2. Matthew writes this, Then what had been spoken through Jeremiah the prophet was fulfilled. A voice was heard in Ramah, weeping in great mourning, Rachel weeping for her children, And she refused to be comforted because they were no more. Does anyone know what Old Testament prophet this is from? Thank you, Jeremiah. It just says it right there. So, um, but yes, this is from the prophet Jeremiah. In Jeremiah chapter thirty-one, verse fifteen, which again this should be on the screen for you. It says, "Thus says the Lord: A voice is heard in Ramah, lamentation and bitter weeping." Rachel is weeping for her children. She refuses to be comforted for her children because they are no more. Here in the book of Jeremiah, this is talking about when God's people were taken into exile. If you remember, two, three weeks ago, we just went through this whole context if you were here with us. But you remember that God told His people through the prophet Jeremiah, had Jeremiah tell the people, repent, 
Turn from your sin. Turn back to God. Turn away from all your immorality, your idolatry. But they wouldn't listen. And so, God allowed the Babylonians to come in in 587 B.C. and destroy their kingdom. Well, when that happened, what they did, what the Babylonians did, is they took all the people to a place called Rama, which is a place just north of Jerusalem. And it's there at Rama where the people were finally separated from each other and then taken into exile into different parts of Babylon. So imagine the scene that is taking place there in Rama. Everyone is being separated from their friends, from their family. Parents, this would be the last time that you will probably ever see your kids. Kids, teenagers, this is the last time you are you are being separated. You're not going to see mom and dad ever again. Separated from your families. You're about to be deported into a different country that you know nothing about. Know no one. Have nothing. I mean, here, the scene that's taking place here, your family is literally being ripped apart. Imagine the pain and the sorrow and the weeping that is going on here in this scene. That's what's happening in Jeremiah 31, verse 15. But if you keep reading, right after that, right after verse 15, we get to verse 16. And it says this, Thus says the Lord, Restrain your voice from weeping and your eyes from tears, For your work will be rewarded, declares the Lord, and they will return from the land of the enemy. There is hope for your future, declares the Lord, and your children will return to their own territory. How can God say that? With this horrible thing that's happening right now, your kids are being taken away from you. You know, all the pain, all the sorrow. How can God say There's hope. It's because what we just talked about a few weeks ago, again, that just because God's people turned from Him and forgotten about Him, God is showing us that He never forgot about them. He never forgot about His people. And God is promising that, yes, this is a a difficult thing right now, but at the end of the day, you know, the big picture... This pain, it's going to go away. I'm going to unite my people once again through this new covenant. We read this in Jeremiah 31, verse 31, starting in verse 31. Behold, days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Not like the covenant which I made with their fathers in the day I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. My covenant which they broke, although I was a husband to them, declares the Lord. But this is the covenant which I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them, and on their heart I will write it, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. They will not teach again each man his neighbor and each man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they will all know me. For the least of them to the greatest of them, declares the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity and their sin. I will remember no more. So, here in Matthew chapter 2, go back to our main text here. Not only do we see Jesus bringing in a new exodus for His people, We also see that he's beginning this new covenant. That this mournful time of no hope, it's about to end. Because with this new covenant, there is hope. That in the midst of your sorrow, in the midst of your pain, I mean, think again, think about those families 
there in Jeremiah 31. They are in pain. Think about the families here in Bethlehem who had just lost their baby because of Herod. There is pain. There is sorrow. There is weeping going on. This is not an easy time for them. But there is hope. Because of Jesus. This new king is born who is going to conquer death. Who is going to put an end to pain and suffering and bring us hope because He's going to reconcile us back to God. You know, for those in this room or watching, maybe you've recently gone through a difficult season in your life. Maybe this past year you've lost someone who is very close to you. You know, that is not an easy time. That is not something that we want to take lightly this morning. You know, we know that's hard to go through, especially, you know, when you come to the holidays. It's, it might be a little bit different this year. Not just that, really every day is a struggle when you lose someone like that. But in knowing what Christmas is really all about, and who Christ is and why He did come to this earth. And knowing that, you can have hope. You can experience true joy even in the midst of your pain. So reasons to rejoice this Christmas. Number one, we see a new exodus. Number two, we see a new covenant. And then finally, we see this new kind of love. A new love. And this is the last quotation or reference that we see here in Matthew chapter 2, and that's found in verse 23, where Matthew writes, And he went and lived in a city called Nazareth, that what was spoken by the prophets might be fulfilled, he shall be called a Nazarene. I'm not going to ask if you know which Old Testament prophet Matthew's referring to here, because that would be a trick question. Because he's not actually quoting any specific Old Testament prophet here. In fact, you will not find a verse in the Old Testament that says he shall be called a Nazarene. So what's Matthew doing here? Well, this is what we do know from Scripture. As you read through the Gospels, we learn that Nazareth was not a well-respected place. It was a place for the lowly for the despised. And in fact, in John chapter 1, when Nathanael finds out that Jesus is from Nazareth, uh, Nathanael says, can anything good come out of Nazareth? Some people said that when I first started here at this church. They're like, can anything good come out of Duncansville? And I don't know, you can answer that for yourself. But you know, Nazarenes were at the bottom of the scale. They were despised rejected, scorned. And that is exactly what we read about from the Old Testament prophets in reference to Jesus. Um, Most famously, if you were to look with me in Isaiah chapter 53, verse 3, the prophet Isaiah says, He was despised and forsaken of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, And like one from whom men hide their face, he was despised, and we did not esteem him. So so really what Matthew is saying here at the end of Matthew chapter 2 is that this new king who has come is going to be rejected by the world. He's going to be a Nazarene. He will be despised. He will be rejected. And that is exactly what we see happen when we read through the life of Jesus. I mean, right here at the very beginning of his life, you have Herod. King Herod wants to kill him because of this new king that's coming in. As you read through the life of Jesus, we read about the chiefs, the the chief priests, the scribes, the religious leaders of the day, all these enemies of Jesus. All these people who, like, if you were 
if you were teaching children's church or talking to little kids and you were reading through an account of Jesus' life, those are people you would refer to as the bad guys of the story. Okay, the enemies of Jesus, those are the bad guys. We don't like to associate ourselves with the bad guys normally. But as we close Matthew chapter 2 this morning, we're actually reminded that we've all rejected him as well. But when you look at this account, we're actually, if there was a person in this story that we would associate ourselves with, like that we would, we are very similar to King Herod in this story. We don't like to say it, but that's really who we are like. That we are afraid of this new king who's come in to invade our kingdom, invade our priorities, our desires, our wants, our lives. We don't like that. And so because of that, we've rejected him. And that's, the, that's really the big picture I want us to see here this morning. That this, is, this account, it's not just about a bunch of people 2,000 years ago or even three, four, five, six thousand years ago in the Old Testament. This is about us. That we are all in slavery to sin. In need of an exodus. In need of deliverance out of that sin. That we are all hurting, in pain, in sorrow, living in this sin-filled world. You know, we can't see any hope. We need hope. And just like those, those bad guys that we refer, refer to in the Bible, just like them, we have all, we're all enemies of, God, of Christ. We've all rejected Him. We've sinned against Him. But the good news in all of this and the reason that we can celebrate this Christmas is because when Christ came, He brought a way for us to be delivered from our sin. He brought in a way that we can have hope and be reconciled back to God. And that even though we rejected Him, He still loved us. Even though we're enemies of Christ, He still loved us. We read in Romans chapter 5, verse 6, For while we were still helpless, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. Jumped out to verse 8. It says in that while we were yet sinners, enemies of God, we've rejected Him. We want nothing to do with Him. Christ died for us. That although we rejected Him by his grace, He has redeemed us. And that gives us great reason to celebrate this Christmas. That He came to this, the whole reason He came to this earth and was born in that manger was so that He could die. And He did. He, he died. He gave His body. He shed His blood for a people who despised him, for a people who rejected him, wanting nothing to do, he still died for every single one of us. That is the greatest Christmas gift of all time. And for anyone who accepts that awesome, undeserved gift, we can be delivered from our sin. We can have hope in the midst of a hurting world. And we can have a relationship with God the Father. That is why Christmas is the most wonderful time of the year. It's not because of our circumstances. It's not because of the Christmas lights or decorations or Christmas presents. It's all because of Jesus. So my challenge to us this morning is Let's make sure that we celebrate Him this year. Let's close in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank You again just for giving us the opportunity to, to worship You together as, as a church body. I pray that You would help us, not just this Christmas season, but every 
day of our lives. Help us to remember why you came to this earth. You did that so that we can have a relationship with God. That's why we were created. That's why we're here on this earth, to, to have that relationship with God and, and, and to, to worship Him. And, and Lord, we thank You. We thank You for making a way for that. We thank You for bringing this way that we can be delivered from our sin. And that's something that we can't do in our own strength. We're all sinners. We've all sinned against You and we're all in need of deliverance and You made a way. Thank You for providing a way for us to have hope for the future. Even in the midst of this difficult world that we're living in. And we're we're so thankful that even when we rejected You, You still loved us. Again, Lord, I ask that we would never take that for granted. I pray that this Christmas season that we would celebrate. And we would celebrate you because that's what it's all about. And so I ask that we would continue to think about these things as we go our separate ways this week. And we just thank and we love you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. There is no greater joy than than this gospel. Joy to the world, the Lord is come. Let earth receive her King. Let every heart prepare Him and heaven and nature sing, and heaven and nature sing, and heaven and heaven and nature sing. Joy to the earth, the Savior reigns. Let men their songs employ, but fields and floods, rocks, hills, and plains. Repeat the sounding joy, repeat the sounding joy, repeat, repeat the sounding joy. No more let sins and sorrows grow, no thorns infest the ground. He comes to make His blessings flow. Far as the curse is found, far as the curse is found, far as, far as the curse is found. He rules the world with truth and grace and makes the nations prove the glories of His righteousness. Wonders of his love and wonders, wonders of his love. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this opportunity to just raise a joyful noise to you this morning, God. And we uh, we thank you for the joy that you do uh, bring us. We we thank you so much uh, for. Um, just sending your son to to earth for us just the the perfect um the perfect gift um the gift that we don't even realize that we we need um but god we need that gift so much and and we thank you um that you knew our needs better than we knew our own needs um god just be with us as we head out onto our um uh, separate ways today and uh, just uh, uh, keep us all safe, and uh, we love and praise you. Amen. Luke 2, and suddenly 
There appeared with the angel a multitude of the heavenly hosts, praising God and saying, Glory to the highest, and on earth peace among men with whom he is pleased. So God is...